Good morning and welcome to GeoIgnite 2021. I'm excited to be part of a great Canadian conference here discussing geospatial activities and geospatial business. Uh, I'm here today to talk a bit about Agriculture Canada and our agri-geomatics group um, and how we are making corporate decisions using geospatial data and the power of location intelligence. So I'm the manager of the geomatics group. My name is James Ashton and, and we're part of the science and technology branch. I'm going to give you a bit of a, a roadmap today on, on where we hope to go for this short presentation. Um, uh, first off, I'm going to give you a, an, an idea of where we sit within the organization and, and sort of how we're structured. To, for those starting out creating enterprise GIS, it, it might be interesting to see the different facets of an enterprise GIS and, and how that works. Uh, I'll give you some reasons why we wanted to create a str strategic ro roadmap and, and show you the mechanics of how we did that and as well how we performed uh, an analysis to, to see our reach into other branches of, of the organization. And, and hopefully you can see how that may be transferable to your own organization or your own business. I'll touch briefly on our uh, COVID-19 information hub, which was a, you know, this pandemic has been long and hard for many people and, and tragic, but uh, it does give us the opportunity to showcase how location intelligence can provide value. Uh, I'll talk about our migration of our core on-premise infrastructure to the Amazon Web Services, as well as uh, uh, show some of our open source ESRI mapping application templates and, and as well how we've published uh, government and Canada information into the ArcGIS online ecosystem for, for anyone to use. Our, our model within the AgriGematics group is that we are generally interested in, in helping the people in the organization and in the department uh, use data and location intelligence to help solve problems and improve their operations. Uh, we sit in the science and technology branch, so uh, you'll see we're outside of IT here. Uh, in the Ontario Quebec region, in the director's office for agri ecosystem resilience, and, and we're flanked in our division with uh, another a number of other geospatial savvy folks, uh, the, the soils group, uh, Canadian Soils Information Service, the agri-climate group, as well as our earth observation friends who, who are uh, using geospatial data and location intelligence, and, and I'll show some of their products today. Within specifically the agri-geomatics group, we have four operational activities. Uh, the web mapping ap applications life cycles where we're uh, constantly creating new maps, whether they're digital streaming maps or PDFs uh, or images that are available for quick uh, sharing uh, on platforms like Twitter and uh, Facebook, but we're also um, you know, do, doing cartography and, and creating uh, these maps on a daily basis, hun hundreds of maps. As well, uh, in the geospatial data manage management realm, we all know that data is moving into uh, every organization with increasing volume, ver velocity and volume, velocity, and variety, and we're responding in, uh, by standardizing that data, cataloging that data in our own internal AFC systems, as well as making it available on the open data platform and the, the Canadian geospatial platform or the federal geospatial platform. We have a self-service mapping platform we've called uh, UMAP, which is the, the utilization of ESRI's uh, ArcGIS Online. And this is a collaborative mapping environment where we're uh, provisioning this cloud service uh, and, and folks are in there every day making business decisions, collaborating to make maps, perform analysis and, and uh, dig into their geospatial issues. Uh, the geospatial analysis and support group is, is again, uh, providing that uh, overall training of, of a number of our internal and external platforms, but they're always there as, sometimes as the front face to uh, uh, working with science or policy folks to answer, answer and influence questions um, and provide timely and rapid response uh, to emerging issues. And if our structure really doesn't make sense, if, if we think about it holistically, we have people, technology, and processes that all sit on top of data. And with our people, we're constantly working to provide uh, new capabilities and training uh, to, to respond to new workforce needs and provide professional development to those individuals 
uh, as we embark on cloud ventures and, and new technologies. Our processes are, are always changing. Uh, so we, we've got a lot of current workflows to sustain operations, but they're all changing as we migrate to cloud-based platforms and uh, other, other venues. Uh, we like to think we're a really good example of business-led IT, which means that we can um, we have enough technical knowledge or, or the way to uh, get technical knowledge and, and partner to get it to, to really uh, be a driver to get our business uh, done and, and utilizing technology to, to get our business done. In the technology front, we do have a large uh, technical footprint that is migrating to the cloud and we're always looking at future data and technology needs uh, as well as trying to take advantage of, of government-wide architectures and standards as, as we do that. Now, uh, switching gears into uh, our roadmap and a strategic plan and why, why many people require a roadmap or a strategic plan, uh, we're often uh, faced with a number of business or technical challenges in the geospatial world. Uh, some of our technical challenges were aging infrastructure, uh, inability to get access to servers in a, in a timely fashion, or, or we are struggling with the uh, required or, or the timelines that we are given in terms of our technology upgrades. And overall, we're just seeing a, a groundswell of uh, our grassroots approach to adopt cloud adoption within, within our team. So we, we knew we had to make some, some big technical changes that we often see in, in large organizations, business challenges uh, when there's executive turnover, uh, as well as just finding and, and sustaining a business sponsor for the work we do in geospatial. Um, we can also see uh, different startups in different, different parts of the organizations not using similar or uh, enterprise processes so, or duplicative efforts in, in the geospatial world. Sometimes this is a, a bonus to get new ideas, but often um, it, it can be a hindrance to overall enterprise development. We were also seeing some challenges to uh, the costs associated with GIS. And um, of course, as I mentioned, not being part of IT, we, we sometimes get labeled as shadow IT, which can be a, a good or a bad thing, depending on how disruptive you wanna be. Um, and, and we were also being faced with unpredictable storage costs, which are our storage is always increasing with, with data uh, streaming into the department. So we needed a strategic plan. And uh, what we did for this was we utilized a capability maturity model uh, that is publicly available called Slim Jim. Uh, the Slim Jim model uh, uses a, a series of questions that uh, you and your enterprise GIS can go through to help really help you systematically diagnose uh, your strengths, weaknesses, and use your maturity uh, uh, to overcome the difficulties in your, in your geospatial uh, enterprise. So I've got some links here uh, with our specific roadmap, uh, as well as some, some links to a video which has the, uh, the founder, Paul Giroux, of the Slim Jim model explaining uh, how to implement it and, and how to use that particular capability maturity model to accept, uh, assess and, and diagnose your enterprise. So uh, assess and diagnose that what the Slim Jim model does is, is takes you through a series of 51 different questions where you rate yourself and that, that provides uh, the diagnosis. And once you have that diagnosis, it really lets you set up your direction, uh, build your roadmap, uh, which you then can uh, action, create actions and, and measurable uh, things to track, uh, which, which enable you to over, overcome your challenges. Uh, and, and you can repeat this annually, of course, uh, which is what, what we do, but we also revisit the roadmap uh, quarterly to, to track our progress on each of the initiatives that, that we have in our roadmap. So it looks like this, you, you rate yourself uh, based on a number of uh, questions, whether you're doing things in an ad hoc fashion, if you're doing things, you know, you're planning doing things or you're in early stages of development, uh, whether you're partially doing things or whether you're, you're really uh, doing these, these things enterprise wide, or in, in some cases, and in, in, in not many cases, you're, you're really knocking it out of the park and, and you're just optimi optimizing those processes. So at the end, end of year one of our Slim Jim diagnosis, uh, we had uh, three challenges. 
uh, five initiatives that translated into eight objectives with 21 key results. And I'll, I'll break this down a little bit, but the key results, the key thing to key results is that they are actually measurable. So they, they're a number uh, which you can track. So, uh, as I said, in year one, we had three specific challenges in AFC. Our roadmap identified that we needed to foster leadership support through engagement and awareness. We need to enhance data and process collaboration across business units. And uh, we, need to, we needed to build and foster a digital transformation culture within our organization. So we, we broke that down into uh, five buckets or, or dispersed it actually in, into five buckets where we could uh, create activities for uh, awareness and engagement, collaboration, workforce, data management, and optimization. So uh, a, an example of a objective and key result, uh, which, which relates back to our, one of our key challenges is that awareness and engagement. It's, it's an improvement and in initiative. So the objective was to foster and executive and business unit understanding and buy-in. And this was all measured uh, by the key result of uh, delivering at least one uh, C-level engagement session with 80% of attendance and to present four updates to the strategic policy data initiative. So in our case, that's the group that was uh, provisioning the overall data strategy for, for, for the organization. So as you can see, these are numbers one and four, so we can track progress ag against those OQRs on a, on a quarterly basis to, to get a snapshot of where we're at. Um, so the Slim Jim process provides uh, very nice uh, overviews of the uh, initiatives and whether uh, we have strengths or weaknesses within those initiatives. Uh, it also provides some, uh, again, dashboards so that you can track the progress of the uh, initiatives and the objectives and key results. So you can see how you're de doing as you revisit uh, quarterly or, or annually as, as you desire. And it also provides the capability to have some nice uh, uh, visuals for senior management rolled up to a, a particular level that shows progress on, on your, your objectives and key results. So another thing we did outside of the Slim Jim model was really reach into the branches of our department. So um, across the top here, uh, there, there is uh, a number of established patterns that uh, exist in the, in the mapping world. So mapping and visualization, data management, field mobility, monitoring, all the way through to sharing and collaboration. And um, these are, you know, the, the pervasive patterns of an enterprise GIS. and and down the left-hand side, we just simply listed the different uh, branches, business partners we have within the organization, and we took a look at you know if we were meeting the lead of meeting the needs of at least one group in that particular branch. Uh, obviously, there's probably lots of people in those different branches that could use location intelligence, but we 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 really just wanted to see uh, who was who was there that we've we've touched and we've worked with, and and lo and behold, we found there were a number of people that we we weren't working with and being that location intelligence can be applied to any different vertical nowadays uh, it gave us new opportunities uh, for collaboration and, uh, and new partners to explore location intelligence and visualizations with and i can happily say that you know a lot of these areas that are yellow have turned to green and many of the areas in red are now uh, either yellow or green now where we've been able to make inroads with with new uh, partners in the department so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the work we've done with those groups. So uh, our strategic policy branch, we have uh, looked at many different problems, a, a couple here, uh, internet connectivity and broadband in rural areas is, of course, a, a very uh, uh, pertinent topic during the pandemic and even before the pandemic. Um, grain transportation is a, is a recurring uh, issue as, as harvest always comes every year. There's uh, predictions of yields and, and in big yield years, uh, we want to make sure the logistics of that supply chain is 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 sound and we can uh, predict any problems. We also uh, work a lot with Indigenous communities and Indigenous programs throughout the organization to, to help understand and, and pr promote Indigenous agriculture. 
our programs branch is, is delivering many different programs to Canadian farmers. Uh, the most recent Living Labs program, we've, we've helped them target and, and provide uh, site locations for potential engagements with farmers. As well, uh, we're constantly working, providing farm rental statistics to programs branch or uh, helping them understand programs like the Dairy Farm Investment Program, which, uh, you know, traditionally these numbers would all be stored away in a database, but uh, now for program managers, we've enabled visualizations to see their program uptake and where their uh, uh, funds and, and uh, expenses uh, are acro across the landscape. Here's another example of working with our programs branch where we've uh, integrated that location intelligence with, with program data, to, again, to see uh, where uh, participants of programs exist, uh, where different defaults have occurred on loans across the, the landscape, as well as to uh, understand um, you know, uh, program uptake uh, across various different years uh, in the program. Another example of uh, using data and location intelligence to target uh, site suitability is uh, with the recently announced uh, Agriculture Climate Solutions Program, uh, which is mainly geared towards uh, targeting carbon, se carbon sequestration across the Canadian landscape. So we took a number of uh, different geospatial layers and, and mashed them up to come up with an index that helps indicate uh, lands across Canada that have the best potential for carbon sequestration. Again, this is a national level study that uh, uh, was using readily available readily available data, but uh, it gives us a framework to then uh, start engaging in discussions with program participants in the various provinces. Our market industry services branch, we, we work a lot with to understand grain exports and imports in various sectors, as well as prepare for uh, African flying swine flu or other different uh, animal related or industry related uh, issues uh, work a lot with this group in, in terms of grain transportation and uh, different uh, commodity structures uh, as well. Uh, we have a process built in for train derailments. When we see those occur, we can rapidly report to senior management on the types of, types of crops that are in the area and land ownership surrounding the derailment or spill. One a recent example of our market industry service branch collaboration is our agribusiness site explorer, which takes a look at uh, 89 different data points and 47 different data layers, including things like minimum wage, uh, industry like soy, the distance to grain elevators, distance to uh, uh, border crossings, uh, enabling uh, people in the sector, various different sectors to just get at all this information and query this information from one central location to help drive business decisions in a specific sector. Uh, exciting new amalgamation of a number of different data sets that will, will help uh, Canadians as well as industry help target their investments and search for uh, new, new uh, places to uh, secure site locations in their industry. Our corporate management branch is, is uh, busy doing a number of things with geospatial information, creating digital uh, 3D representations, but also doing day-to-day business of divestiture of some assets that uh, the government is divesting of. So water control structures and community pastures are either being divested or transferred to provincial ownership or uh, producer group ownership. And uh, all of that needs to be looked at in terms of uh, site access, ownership, uh, mineral rights, access rights. And, and without doing this with maps, uh, I can probably say it just would never get done. Uh, trying to uh, understand the, the landscape with, without a map is uh, difficult. You, you simply can't make those business decisions on a spreadsheet. And the science and technology branch, our home branch, we're, we're obviously working in a number of areas to enable digital products that come out from our uh, scientists and from our uh, lines of business, including soils, climate, and, and earth observation. 
investment. These help with reporting. These help with uh, investment decisions throughout uh, the growing season and uh, as well report on a number of climate related activities to support decision making in, in the branch, in policy and, uh, and in the public realm. Switching gears to our COVID-19 uh, geospatial information hub, we uh, early on in the pandemic were asked by the deputy minister to try and uh, engage with a number of different data scientists and uh, data savvy folks across the organization to, to provide a platform to look at maps, look at data, share data, and uh, create a multidisciplinary approach to, to a really big problem. Um, we were very active for, for a long time and still are active at, at mapping various aspects of the pandemic. Um, but this for us was a, a real shift into providing a, a, a number of different applications uh, all glued together uh, in one hub site. So it, it's instead of providing one application, in this case, we're providing almost a, a website of many, many different applications, uh, providing an immersive experience for, for those in the department that had access to this information. So we were very uh, uh, proud and uh, very um, thankful that our partners at uh, NRCAN and PHAC were already mapping the disease. That was a huge bonus for us and that we didn't have to worry about mapping the disease numbers. We could actually focus on the sector-based responses uh, that were required in, in agriculture. Uh, and it looked a little bit like this. You know, we, we broke things down with our policy folks into four key areas of food system assets, agri-food labor, food transportation, and vulnerable populations, and really dug into the those four core areas, supporting it with maps, data intelligence, and, uh, and uh, visuals. Uh, we looked at food system assets and, and where uh, food banks and organizations that disperse food were. Uh, very quickly, we looked at agriculture labor and the temporary foreign worker program and, and where uh, folks were coming into the country and uh, where their shortages were. Uh, we looked at food transportation and, and, and logistics of uh, areas in, in Canada that were uh, importing a lot of foods that we imported a lot of and foods that we exported a lot of and, and their mode of transportation into the country. As well, we uh, created an index for vulnerable people, uh, mashing up a number of different data sets to uh, see where the large concentrations of vulnerable populations were across Canada based on a, on a number of different layers. Uh, we looked at food and restaurant uh, uh, recovery in terms of opening of restaurants across the world and, and across our provinces. Uh, we built data pipelines with Google uh, mobility data to uh, understand how uh, different uh, retail and recreation parks, uh, grocery and pharmacy were, were changing due to their normal uh, traffic patterns. Uh, we looked a, a lot at retail sales intelligence within the ag industry and, and consumer goods as well. We were understanding different livestock slaughter intelligence for both beef and, and cattle. Uh, as, as you can imagine, there were a number of different uh, wing nights and, and pizza nights that weren't happening across the country. So this was creating some uh, logistics and uh, surplus situations in, in some industries. And we helped our policy folks understand that situation spatially. We looked at where uh, high occurrences of disease were and where uh, high numbers of paid agricultural employees in our sector were and created these bivariate maps to help understand uh, where those two values were both high or both low. Um, I'm going to switch gears now into, into less about the products and, and the support that we provide to the organization, but I want to talk a little bit more about the, 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 the data uh, and the systems that are behind that. So, you know, crazy architecture diagram here that that pro, uh, probably uh, doesn't mean much but this is suffice to say that all the all the tools and processes that we have in the background are, are slowly making their way out of the on-premise environment uh, to the cloud and and that takes a lot of uh, architecture and process work um, we what we've 
can safely say about our, our our venture to the cloud is it's a journey. It's not a it's not really a migration. Um, the journey requires retooling. The journey requires uh, process improvement and process rewriting uh, in total. So uh, the the continuous integration and the continuous development and the utilization of DevOps processes all take time to learn and to uh, understand to to take full advantage of that that uh, that environment and and not just doing a lift and shift of your current operations but actually uh, using the cloud holistically to to improve your business. We're also doing a, a lot of work around cloud-based data integration. So. Uh, as you can see, much of our data is web enabled. That's what we spend a lot of time doing in data management. But we also see these uh, public uh, sites where we're getting public archives of rapid recurrence imagery. So the Landsat and Sentinels of the world, um, as well as hopefully some, some Canadian content uh, are, are being made publicly available. So we can utilize these new tools and technologies, standards and formats. This is a very, uh, volatile space right now in terms of bringing solutions to the table. But I think as we begin to work through uh, standards and formats like stack and uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF, we can uh, begin to see some uh, really good demonstrations of how EO data can uh, provide downstream value. Uh, I won't talk much about our uh, AFC embedded framework, but there's some links here where you can see how we've coupled uh, some open source technology from Esri along with uh, their ArcGIS online environment to enable rapid development of government compliant web applications. So WCAG compliant for accessibility and uh, uh, other people with some dexterity problems. So I encourage you to check out those links and, and see how easy it is to make a government compliant web map. Another thing we've done in, in the ArcGIS Online realm is to, to take all of the government data that's registered with the Canadian Geospatial Platform or the, the Federal Geospatial Platform, and we constantly update those data sets uh, within the ArcGIS Online environment. So it's, it's, it's hard to argue with an environment that is uh, uh, being utilized by millions and millions of people every day to make uh, geospatial decisions in the public. So that's why we think it's it's really great to, to have all the data registered in that environment for uh, people that uh, are using that environment. So we, we readily found that uh, people in our organization wanted to use government data in that system, uh, but, but couldn't find it. So we've registered it there for, for everyone. So there, there are more links here if you're interested in some of our communications that we have internally or our public uh, web presence. And of course, you can find all of our information on the open data platform at opencanada.ca. And thanks very much for the opportunity to chat with you today. I hope I didn't keep us uh, too long, but um, I'm super uh, excited about the conference and I wish uh, everyone well uh, during these challenging times. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks uh, for that uh, very, very insightful talk, James. Um, it's always good to see you again. I think uh, we interact often. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that was a great, very insightful uh, talk. And as we have a couple of minutes for questions. And so I'm going to start with one of my own because, you know, as somebody who runs a technology company with a geomatics background, the one thing about moving from legacy and on-premise, and I'm starting kind of at the end of your presentation before we go to some of the questions at the front. How can you say the workforce is changing and adapting to these new technological knowledge needs, the, your workforce, the geomatics workforce within your uh, department? Is it responding quickly enough to be able to uh, help you with some of these types of changes and migrations you're making, James? It's a great question, David, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I, I don't think they're, uh, you know, it's always just challenging. We want we want to change faster and faster, but it's it's 
it, it is a new skill set that's really required to to take full advantage of the cloud. And um, I think it's important that organizations and businesses take into account uh, what their what their true business is. And um, I, what we find is that we have to dig deeper into our organizations. Uh, you know, and, and you may lose a GIS programmer to someone that needs needs to then fulfill the whole uh, cloud DevOps role as well. Um, and that takes away from the core business of providing geospatial solutions. So um, ideally, we would like to have an influx of, of new new staff and, and uh, other skill sets to, to really perform that DevOps and, and cloud savvy role that we know will be a part of being successful in the future. So, so some of the things that we're doing is partnering with uh, third parties or external resources to bring in that skill set and you know teach it to some to some of our folks internally. Well, it's a very very good approach because it is a common challenge for a lot of the geo spatial industry migrating. Uh, just you know, I'll rush through a couple of other questions here. There's one uh, just in the interest of time, really. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Tom who asks a very interesting question: uh, What what is the what's the adoption rate amongst producers like are producers making extensive use of agri-climate statistics in their practices yeah I, I think they are you know i think there's uh and we'll see in the in the next census year coming up next year uh the the increased adoption rates i think of technology our business is is uh, somewhat more broad and national, but uh, I think the farmers edges of the world and, and other uh, people providing providing those farm scale farm level uh, applications are, are seeing a huge uptake of their products and services, and uh, it's all part of us all becoming more more digital in in our affairs and and trying to increase the bottom line. So I think uh, I think it's a big big market. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, I, I think I have time for a couple more questions here. I'll ask one here from Philip Martins. Um, do you feel there is pushback from your department, federal government, regarding the application of GIS tools? And how do you feel as a GIS professional trying to get others, including senior management, on board with different programs and initiatives that use GIS? Uh I don't feel any pushback at all, really. I think there's uh, just a, a huge uh, increase in adoption of geospatial across the whole department. Uh, some have called us, you know, the best kept secret in the department. I think we're really coming of age now as the digital literacy across the, you know, across the world becomes more and more uh becomes better um people are seeing that we've been doing this stuff for a long time and that we're very capable uh, i mean ai and machine learning were were part of gis uh to some degree for for quite a long time in these different classification methods so we can we can show these types of uh we can provide leadership in roles of data management and and analytics for sure and help mature the whole organization i think yeah, I completely agree with you. I think there's just so much hidden knowledge and, and technology in use in this geospatial space for so long um, that when it comes out to the front, it, you know, people wonder if we're playing in the wrong space, but we've always been playing that space. Um, I think we have time for one last question here uh, from Henry Parsons. Um, have you explored moving the GIS infrastructure into core IT versus the shadow IT you mentioned? I ask because this could free up the GIS team to really focus on GIS rather than the infrastructure, which I guess kind of ties to previous question about workforces and capability. Absolutely. We do have strategic partnerships with a couple of different components of our core IT group, and that has worked well for us over the years. Um, but, uh, you know, I think every organization is, is different and, and where GIS actually sits in, in the department is probably unique in each situation. We have found it's been advantageous for us to be close uh, to all the different lines of business, but then have those strategic partnerships into IT to provide some of that core production IT uh, server work. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's, uh, sorry, Jim, you know, we've got to going to the break for our next talk, but it's really, really exciting to see all the things you've done. I've learned something new about Slim Jim, and, and I've always battled with how OKRs can be made easier for people to understand. And I think that's something I've learned a lot about today. And it's really exciting to see the kind of 
strategic activities that you've undertaken and we really wish you success in, in your endeavors in growing geomatics use um, in our government departments and in agri-carnada specifically. Um, yeah, I think with that for now, we're just gonna move on to the break and I'm sure everything that you've shared is available for people to get your contacts and shoot some more questions your way. Thank you so much, James, and um, really appreciate your time. Great, and thanks for this wonderful opportunity to share agriculture and agri-food Canada's geospatial activities. Take care.